Praise the Lord. It's really been wonderful being here. And I trust that we've all been encouraged in the Lord, challenged in the Lord, blessed in the Lord. I want to speak tonight about a subject we really need to get to grips with, and that is the person of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and his ministry in the end time church and through the end time church. The Holy Spirit, He, the Holy Spirit, not it. Amen. The third person, the God, it equal with the Father, equal with the Son, with the Son. He is Lord. The Lord who is active in the church today, as I believe it was uh, Chris was sharing with us, that it is He who is guiding the church, instructing the church, and without Him, you and I can do absolutely nothing. The Holy Spirit is not tongues. Should I say that slowly? The Holy Spirit is not tongues. He is a divine person. Tongues happens to be a gift. Do all speak with tongues? The answer is no. So, where do we start? We pray. Precious Father, we thank you for that last song. A reminder that your word, O oh God, is a treasure chest. It's not just a light to our path, my Lord, but it is the rock on which our lives are built for it is Jesus' heart made manifest to us. It is the will of God written to us in a letter, inviting us to know the God behind the Word, the Spirit who communicates with us through the Word of the living God, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. We bless you, Father. We worship you, my God, that you have not left us as orphans, but you have sent the Helper, the Spirit of Truth who leads us into all truth. Lord my God, I stand here before my precious brothers and sisters naked. Lord, with nothing to offer, save what you put upon my heart and upon my lips. And I pray that this night, Lord, I would accurately speak what you would have us here in Jesus' name. That you would, my Lord, once more raise your standard and your banner. That truth might come back to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That my God, that we put away the traditions and the foolishness and the silliness that we might take our place, my Lord, and end this race well. Be with us, my God. Let your will truly be done this night. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 1. A theme that has run throughout this conference has been that of... Surrendering to the Lord and, if need be, surrendering our very lives unto death. We have been touching on the subject of martyrdom, haven't we? Acts chapter 1. Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen again. He has spent 40 days with his disciples, teaching them and explaining to them the things concerning the kingdom, as Luke records. And just as he's about to ascend into heaven, he says to his disciples in verse 4, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. There is so much confusion amongst evangelical Christians regarding what Jesus says here. The promise of the Holy Spirit. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What is this baptism? Has it got anything to do with salvation? Let me ask you a question. At this point, were the disciples born again? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. No, I'm just celebrating. Thank the Lord. Praise God. There's hope. There is hope. 
When I ask that question in South Africa, I have people saying, no, no, not born again, definitely not. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Truly, the brethren who have gone before have done a wonderful and sterling job with you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. We are born again by the Holy Spirit at salvation. He comes and indwells our spirit, as Jesus said in John chapter 3, that unless a man is born of the water that is the word of God, washing over the soul, giving understanding, and of the spirit who comes and indwells the heart and regenerates, brings back fellowship into the spirit of man, comes and sets up residence within you. Unless a man is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is altogether a different work of the spirit. It is the promise of God. It is God's desire to fill His children with the Holy Spirit. Because without the Spirit, you and I can do absolutely nothing. Of course, the disciples, like so many Christians, because now they are born again. We're not Christians. That's a term that was rather derogatory. But as new believers, they're concerned with the kingdom. And they ask the Lord... Therefore, when they come together in verse 6, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, we just want to walk in the glory of God's kingdom. We want all the benefits of the kingdom now. To which Jesus responds in the seventh verse, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And he brings them back on track. And he says in verse 8, But you shall receive Dunamis, you shall receive the miraculous power of God. You shall receive power. Dunamis. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, you will receive dunamis that you may be my witnesses. That word witness is an interesting word in the Greek. It is the Greek word martus, martus, from where we get the English word martyr. The word witness and the word martyr, Stephen the martyr, and the word witness in the Greek language is one and the same word. You and I are empowered to become martyrs. We are empowered to testify of Jesus even until death. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be so sold out, so full of a boldness, so full of faith, that we will even give up our lives. That is why we need to be filled. Who would want to reject such a promise? Who would want to go helter-skelter from the excess in the demonic to a reformed church? Who in their right mind would want to try to live this Christian life in their own strength? Listening to some dead preacher trying to persuade you through one verse of Scripture taken out of context that the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for today. You've got to be moros. Another Greek word. Foolish. Not unintelligent, but willfully stupid. Am I being hard? I hope so. Because somebody has got to pour a bucket of water upon the church. Are we out of our minds that the very promise of God we reject? Because many of our brethren have gone into the twilight zone. Am I going to reject God's promise because of Rodney Howard Brown? Listen, he can drink at Satan's version of Joel's fountain all day long. But that is not going to stop me from being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't care who does what. The Word of God is God's truth. 
it will abide when earth does not exist anymore. And as for me, myself and I, the three of us, we are going to trust God to walk in the power of the Spirit because I know that I cannot live without Him. And I will not tolerate being around Christians who think that they can. Now, am I getting a little bit heated on the collar? That's why we're black tonight. <laughs> we are either going to have a funeral or a wedding. <laughs> but it's time, saints, that we get back to the Word of God. Amen. Because we are looking at Jesus here speaking to 11 men who have gone through three and a half years of discipleship with God in the flesh. Three and a half years. Then, for a post-grad course, they have another 40 days with Jesus in his resurrected form. Now they're having Bible study with God. Not the man Christ, Jesus. But with Christ in his, not necessarily in his glory, but unveiled to their eyes. If it was any one of us, we would have got in our cars and gone to go change the world. Christians have a vision and a dream, and now they think they're called into ministry. With all those credentials, Jesus turns around and says to them, You are not equipped. You are not ready. You are of no use to my kingdom yet. Think about those words. He could not let them go and fulfill the Great Commission. He couldn't. They would fail. And how many of us are trying to labor for Jesus and we're not baptized in the Holy Spirit? Or we once were baptized. But we're not even... We were once... The word, do you know what the word baptized means? It comes from the Greek word, baptizo, from the Greek root, bapto, which means to be fully saturated, overwhelmed, made wet. It is to be hit by a tsunami. That's wet, wet. In Hebrew, when we say word twice, it gives emphasis. Most of us aren't even damp anymore. And we think that we can do anything for God. Maybe come out of who my people also refers to the Reformed churches. Have you ever thought of that? You deny the, the person of the Holy Spirit in his ministry who think that they can take the, advance the kingdom of God in their own strength without the person of the Holy Spirit empowering, leading, guiding them? Do you think that you can, that you can face persecution without the Holy Spirit who is given, as verse 8 says, that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be martyrs to me. Not just in Jerusalem or in Judea, but in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I want us to see a truth in the word of God. That the apostles of the early church understood that without the Holy Spirit, they could not function. That every church they planted was planted by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want us just to look at Scripture a bit here. And we'll do it systematically. Romans chapter 15. I want tonight. I have no the, the, the chance of being invited back. I don't know. I could blow it tonight. And I need... To be faithful to God. The Lord is wanting to prepare an end time church. A church that will stand for Him. A church that will stand fast. Not because they've got their theology all together. Not because they've got any virtue in themselves. But because they are full of the Spirit of God. Their faith, their hope, their trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the great promise the Holy Spirit, our helper, our parakletos, the one who stands with us to assist us. In Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to 
Go from verse 14, because there is a certain truth we need to touch on. We need new teachers in the body. The ones that we've had, we've had great ones. They've passed away. We need a new breed of teachers and prophets. And dare I say, apostles. Ooh, that's a scary word. But according to Ephesians, God has given the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and teacher for the edifying of the body. So we all come to the unity of the faith, if you read the whole portion of Scripture. Have we come to the unity of the faith? Has the church become perfect yet? No, we will not have Paul's and Peter's and James and John's. We won't have those types of apostles to whom God entrusted his word. But an apostle is the Greek word apollos, apostol, the sent out one, a messenger, that Greek word. Paul writes, Romans 15, 14, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you, because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. I just want to pause there. Paul writes this letter to the Roman church, a church he had never been to. And he's writing to them to make perfect their doctrine and their understanding. Many of us, sorry, let me say it, let me rephrase it. Most of us here are born again. But not all of us have got our theology right and our doctrine right. Anyway, I don't know why I'm saying that. Scrap it. Verse 17. We'll cut it out. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit. It was by the power of of the Spirit with God confirming the word with mighty signs and wonders, that the Gentiles paid attention to the gospel message. It was the power of God. Now, the Jews seek a sign and Greeks wisdom. So it's okay for the Greeks to see signs and wonders. We don't seek signs and wonders, saints. But let me assure you of this one thing. It is the pattern of God that he confirms his word with signs and wonders. You go through the scriptures and you start in the book of Genesis and you will see that God has always glorified his word, confirmed his word with the miraculous. It is a pattern. In 1999, I was in prayer and seeking God and fasting and the Lord laid on my burden to trust him Once more, to see the Spirit of God moving, confirming His Word. Not outside His Word, but confirming His words. His Word, I should say. And I've been seeking God and praying. And as I read the Scriptures, I just see this connection. Whenever Jesus ministered, there would be something miraculous. And they would draw the crowds. And then He'd get the attention and then teach them and speak. Signs and wonders are so much part of the gospel, so much part of our witness. Now, I know that as I'm talking, the barriers are coming up. We thought this guy was sound. We thought he was all right. And now we're getting the walls up because we're not treading onto very uncomfortable territory. Is he going to go the Kenneth Copeland way? Is he going to go the Benny Hinn way? Is he just going to stop, just roll over and become a, a typical South African and do a Rodney Hart Brown on us? Because, I mean, can there be anything good that comes out of South Africa? (laughs) But Paul, the the word of the apostle, he, he says that I dare not speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished in me. 
or through me, in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedience in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, a portion of Scripture that many of us are very familiar with. It shouldn't take you long to get there. Two or three pages at the most, to the right. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech, or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I made a conscious effort, Paul says. I'm not going to get into some deep theological debate with you. I'm not going to approach this academically. I'm going to preach the simple word of God. I'm going to come to you in humility, trusting that the Spirit of God will confirm the words I say in power. I determined not to know anything amongst you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Saints, you need to excuse me. My salvation, my whole encounter with God was very supernatural. It was really supernatural i did not come to faith the normal way like most christians somebody sharing the gospel with me and explaining jesus that didn't happen god arrested my attention he literally got me to believe i came to faith without knowing that jesus is god i came to faith really not understanding the gospel at all I came to faith because the convicting power of God so overwhelmed me. God drew me. I, I, when you see the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, and you are enveloped in the fragrance of His presence, as an Orthodox Jew, Something happens to you. And I began to weep and cry. I could not. I can, I, such a conviction came over my soul. That I broke. I just broke down in tears. And I didn't weep. I just. <sighs> this, it, I wailed. In repentance. And the more I wept. The more I cried. And the more I just repented of my, of my wickedness and my sin, the, I just felt this washing coming over me, this unbelievable cleansing of God. And after 12 or 15 minutes of just weeping and crying, and I stood just in a puddle of tears. And the young, young guy who was present said to me, David, you've just been born again. I didn't know what it meant. He then said, Jesus has come into your life. And I knew that was true. My whole, my, 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 my coming into the Christian faith was by God's manifest power. And by His grace alone, I have I've walked in His glory and power. I've seen His power. I've seen God's glory. So for me, this is not theology. I can back it up theologically. But this is real. The Holy Spirit is real to me. I understand the words of Paul. I came to you in fear and trembling. Folk in my church said, are you excited to go overseas? I said, no. I'm petrified. And they laughed. But then they asked my wife. And he said, Jackie, isn't David joking? And she said, no. She's not. Because he knows he can't do anything without God. Saints, I'm a living testimony. That all you need to do is, is trust the living God. I have no virtue. I have no strength. I'm unskilled in the word of God. I have no Bible college degree. I've never been discipled. I'm just... A broken man who has encountered a glorious Savior. You got full of the Holy Spirit. 
the moment of his salvation. And I can understand, I can relate to the Apostle Paul. I can relate to the writers of Scripture. And I want to encourage you, because many of you have been so hurt and so disappointed and so disillusioned and come into such confusion about the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you, saints, I'm nothing. I'm not, going to, I'm not here to exalt me. I'm here to exalt the one in whom I believe. I'm here to exalt God. I'm here to exalt Jesus. The one who saved me and saved you and filled me with his spirit. I want to encourage you that there's a pattern in scripture. God does not want us to walk in our own strength. God does not want us to stand in our own ability. God wants us to be broken. He wants us to be contrite of heart. He wants us to depend on him. He doesn't want us to come with anything except empty hands and open hearts. That's all the Lord wants. In Thessalonians, I want to establish a pattern. I want, to, sorry, I want to show you the established pattern of Scripture that the early churches were birthed in the power of the Holy Spirit. The early believers they had encountered God's glory and God's power. Remember the words of Jesus. And you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that you may be my witnesses. Christianity is not a philosophy. We're not meant to debate and to discuss. Now, I'm, I have, I'm not against apologetics at all. But if there's no power, all we're going to have is arguments. When Paul goes to Thessalonica, he says in Chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 5. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Like the gospel came in power. Hebrews, chapter 2. The writer of Hebrews, whomever he may be. You're welcome to your opinions. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. The writer of Hebrews, who was clearly not an apostle, says this. <laughs> well, he, called, he says that he was an apostle. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have he heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we, if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So when these Jewish believers received the word of God, it was an environment with signs and wonders and various miracles as God permitted. As the Holy Spirit permitted. Where did the charismatic movement go wrong? I am a charismatic Christian. I am charismatic. I believe in the gifts. I'm a tongue-talking, hand-clapping, foot-stomping. Believer, I am. I am. I've got to contain myself all the time. But my doctrine is not word of faith. But in my expression, I am completely, utterly, over the top, charismatic. The charismatic church went wrong, saints, when man begin, began to dictate to God. When we thought that somehow we could control the Holy Spirit. When, when we stopped walking in absolute reverence of God. When we took the glory of God for granted. When we thought that we were somebody. And then we became arrogant. And we stopped trusting God to be the expounder of His Word. That the gifts and the signs and the wonders became more important than the Word of God. There is a great truth in Scripture... In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I believe it's from verse 27, Paul, in the middle of speaking about spiritual gifts, 
equates the body of Christ to a human body. We're all important. We have different giftings. We're placed in the body just as the Lord chooses. The eye cannot, you know, cannot save the hand because I'm not a hand. I'm not of the body. God places in the body just as he chooses. And the Apostle Paul says this in the 27th verse. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, and third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. There's something really powerful in this. Why would God put the apostles, the prophets, and the teachers first? That word, God has, that word first, God has placed these first in the body, is the Greek word proton. It means first in order, rank, or importance. There are three gifts that are more important than any other. In order, apostle, prophet, teacher. What on earth do those three offices have in common? The word of God. That's right, Chrissy. The word of God. The apostles, prophets, and teachers are the gifts that God has given the church to lay firm, strong, immovable, unshakable foundations. Once the foundations are in place, then the gifts of the Spirit, the miracles, they are secondary. They are always secondary. The moving of the Holy Spirit is always secondary to the Word, as we had the panel discussion just uh, earlier on today. And all the speakers, all the, all the, the guys on the, on the panel were saying the same thing. Every experience... Or every what manifestation needs to line up perfectly with the word of God. Because this is our highest authority. And so where the charismatic church went wrong was this glorious word. The anchor of our souls was cast asunder. And it was all about experience. When Toronto came, well, listen, Toronto started before there was Toronto. There was the South African. That's where it started. And one of the very first churches he came to was the church that I attended. And I watched him and our senior pastor mock the word of God. In a drunken demonic stupor. <laughs> I can't read this thing. And threw the Bible on the ground. They cursed the word. That was the birth of the Toronto blessing. Or the Toronto cursing. That's how it was birthed. When the word of God was mocked and thrown asunder. That's where the charismatic revival went wrong. Saints... God is restoring his church. He's restoring the soundness of doctrine. Many of you have had your doctrines sorted out. But now God is wanting to bring completeness in the fullness of the Spirit. The soundness of doctrine in the fullness of the Spirit. This is what God is busy with. Please hear what I'm saying. This is not my opinion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, the Apostle Paul makes this statement. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. He's not saying that the word is not important. But he's saying that the word is confirmed by the power of God. Ours is not a dead faith, saints. I'm really militant about this, and I pray that some, if one of you would become militant, I would be most excited. Ours is the only faith that serves the true God. Yes. 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 Do you not think that God wants to confirm His Word? That we are the ones that are quenching the Spirit. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Romans, in Romans, Paul writes and he says, the kingdom of God 
is not food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy, hara in the Hebrew, a calm delight. Not a crazy rolling on the floor, cackling like a witch. It is a calm delight. It is a, it is a joy in the midst of a storm. Because you know him. You have touched the hem of his garment. Oh, there are times where the Lord withdraws his presence. Don't get me wrong. There are times where you cannot sense him. And they might go on for years. But that's after you've touched the hem of his garment. After you have met with the person of the Holy Spirit. Our saints is the true faith. Our God is the true God. Amen. Why do we not allow God to be God? Amen. Why are we so petrified that Satan is going to come into our churches when we truly are seeking him? I'm going to touch on that a bit, a bit later. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul gives a command to the church. First Thessalonians 5. Verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. That word quench Benomi in the Greek. Benomi. It is a verb. It means to extinguish. As one would extinguish a fire. That is what it means to extinguish. So some of your translations might be do not put out. Do not quench. The Holy Spirit. What does John the Baptist say of Jesus Christ? He says, After me, one comes. Whose sandals I'm unworthy to loosen. Whose sandal straps I'm unworthy to loosen. He says, I indeed baptize you with water, but after me comes one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and a sparkler. <laughs> with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire. Our God is a consuming fire. When the Lord, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the faithful 120 on the day of Pentecost, He comes as flaming tongues of fire. And the Apostle Paul says to the church of Thessalonica, don't extinguish him. Amen. Don't extinguish the fire of God. Don't put him out. You want the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Put away your fire extinguisher. Put away your doubt. Put away your unbelief. Put away your strife. I don't have to go into the difference between the Spirit of God at salvation and the Spirit of God, <coughs> the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We all know this, it's, it's different. Praise the Lord. So that takes at least two hours of my message. <laughs> Saints, I'm not reprimanding you. I'm not at all. Please, it's not a reprimand. This is an impassioned plea to come back to the word of the living God and to trust our Lord. The Gospel of Luke, if you would. Luke chapter 11. I want to address a common fear that I've encountered amongst the faithful remnant. In South Africa, because we have been responsible for, much, for a lot of error that has come into the church, the faithful brethren there are petrified to have anything to do with the Holy Spirit. Now, our church is really different. We are, we, we, we're not like that. But there are many really wonderful men of God and lovely congregations in the country that are absolutely petrified to even talk about the Holy Spirit, 
to even pray for the folk in the, their congregations to receive the Holy Spirit. They don't even pray for people anymore. They don't pray for healing. They don't pray for anything. Because they're so petrified that an evil or demonic spirit is going to come in. There's a paranoia in the church. And it's here too. The church, I would say, not universally, but certainly in the West, the sound, those who are seeking to be sound in Christ have got to deal with paranoia. This unbelievable fear that Satan can just waltz into our churches and take over. As a young believer, a few months old in the Lord, I woke up one night and there was this black mass next to me. I couldn't, def couldn't see it. It was just this big black evil thing. And I took one look at it and I said, in the name of G, I didn't get to zzz. <laughs> and this thing just shot out of my room. Oh, <laughs> I've never ever had a demonic attack or anything since then. Because I have, through the word of God, I am absolutely convinced that what Jesus said when he said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I am so convinced that Jesus wasn't lying. That I'm not fearful of anything demonic. Why? Because I'm strong? Lord forbid. Lord forbid. But I know who indwells me. I know what, what Satan sees when he looks at me. He sees a real useless bunch of garbage, but he sees the Holy Spirit inside. And that scares the hell out of him. Saints, it is our unbelief. That gives Satan the legal right to trample on us. He is the deceiver. He walks around like a lion. He is not a lion. There is only one spiritual lion. And he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's Jesus Christ who's coming back again. He's the lion. He's the Lord. Well, I come from Africa, man. We know something about lions. You look at a lion, you look into those eyes, that lion has absolutely no fear. There is such, you look into the eyes of a lion, there is such confidence, it's actually, it's scary, it's intimidating. They just look at you and it's like, you are so lucky I'm not hungry. <laughs> because I'll just rip the door off your car and I'll swallow you. They have no fear. Satan is not like that. He's like a roaring lion. He's an imposter. Seeking whom he may devour. And who may devour? Those who do not know who they are in Jesus Christ. God has not called us to be strong. He's called us to be strong in him. Amen. Do you see the difference? Yes. Do not think I am strong, saints. Please do not. You see me outside of here. I sit alone. I'm very quiet. But when I stand up in my calling, like you, if you would believe God and stand up in your callings, a boldness comes upon you. An assurance comes upon you. Because He is the Spirit of power. Satan seeks whom he may devour. He has the legal right to devour those who will not put their faith and trust in God. Even amongst the believers. You empower Satan. Either Jesus stripped him, or Jesus did not strip him of his power over the believer. Either you have received power and authority over him, or you haven't. Choose whom you're going to believe. The word of the living God, or the lies of Satan. Or your own fears. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you, saints? This word only has power when it is planted in your heart and you believe it. You've heard a you've heard much the last few days about pondering, meditating, filling yourself with this word. Saints, it's time that you take, took on your identity in Christ. 
You've heard Chris talking about the occult. Visualization. Visualizing what you want. Well, the Word of God tells you who you are in Jesus Christ. How about spending time pondering on that? How about spending time praying to that? Saying, God, help me to believe your word. Why can't we be like the paralytic's father? I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Oh, my God, I do believe, but I'm not. I battle to receive it for myself. That's where you, most of us are. I know what the word of God says, but it's not for me. I'm battling, Lord, to receive it for me. Pray these things through. Let's deal with these things, saints. Let's get these things settled in our heart. The church of Jesus Christ is crippled. She's broken. She's ineffective. It's like just one gigantic hospital. At some stage, we have to get healed. At some stage, we have to allow the balm of Gilead to wash over us. At some stage, we've got to believe God. Luke chapter 11. Read from verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Will you give your son a stone if they ask for bread? Anybody? Would you? Of course, ridiculous. Verse 11. If a son asks for bread from any father... So, did I read that? Yes. We've done the stone. Now we're going to the fish. If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Which one of us does not try our very best for our children? Is that not what we do? Is that not instinctive? Absolutely. Well, who's the ultimate parent? Who is he who's called Abba? In term of endearment, Daddy. Abba. If you then, verse 13, if you fallen, if we fallen, will do anything to give the very best to our children. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them or ask Him? Think about this. We are warring that if we ask God for the Holy Spirit, that Satan is going to come marching in. Are we out of our minds, saints? Where is our faith? Roger mentioned earlier this afternoon, Quoting from Luke, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? Look at us. That's talking to us. He's speaking to you and me. He's speaking to the church right now. The question that Jesus is asking is a question he asked 2,000 years ago. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? He's coming back. What's he going to find? Oh, Lord. No, we we, we, we can't pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We can't pray for anything. Because what happens if a demonic spirit comes in? Dear Lord, do you think that God is unable to stop Satan? Where are we, saints? Do you see how far we as born-again believers have fallen? That we can't even believe God to keep his church safe. We need to get on our knees and repent of our unbelief. And for blaspheming the person of God. Do you serve the almighty? Or do you serve a regional God that has limited power? What do you serve? Who do you serve? Have you made yourself another God? Have you fashioned for yourself another God? Who is omnipotent? Sorry, who is imp impotent, not omnipotent. Is your God not powerful enough to raise up a banner against Satan when the enemy comes in like a flood? 
The Spirit of the Lord raises up a banner against him. Who is this God that you serve? Because I don't know about you, but I know the God I serve. The God I serve. I've seen the power of God. I've seen demons being cast out in the name of Jesus Christ. Who is your God? Who's your daddy? Saints, I hope this is getting through to you. We, the church, have been deceived by Satan. And it's time we open up our eyes. If we, being evil, know to give good gifts to our children, how much more will God the Father give the Holy Spirit to them or ask? Are we asking? He was given that we might be witnesses. He was given that we might testify of Jesus. He was given that we might stand. He was given to help us, to empower us, to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, to instruct us. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, unbelief has quenched the spirit in the church. There are three things that have quenched the spirit. Unbelief is a chief amongst them. Paul writes in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Do you... Every time we fight with each other, devour each other, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Saints, we must keep our lips from speaking God. We need to walk in love with one another. We need to walk in unity amongst the true brethren. We need to. Because when we don't, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. And do not expect the Holy Spirit to be manifest amongst us if we're grieving Him. These things are serious. Saints, these things are serious. By this time, you are convinced that we are going to be persecuted. And by this time, you should be convinced that you can't stand in your own strength. Which means we need the Holy Spirit. And if anything that we do is going to grieve him or keep him away. We need a change. So as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, don't grieve him. And then he says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger be put away. The divisions amongst you, put it away. Don't do anything to grieve the Spirit. He is portrayed in the New Testament as a dove. doesn't mean he's powerless on the contrary. But his character, he's not going to fight with you. He's just going to simply withdraw. He's going to simply withdraw. So it's up to us, by the grace that God gives through the Spirit, to strive for the unity amongst the true believers. It's up to us. As I said when I spoke uh, the first night, it's not about liking one another. It's about loving one another. Love is the greatest command. Please, saints. The Spirit of God carries the, will have the same character as the Father. He is love. Therefore, if we have got bitterness between one another, He's not going to be amongst us. And then Paul says in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
Do you understand what the will of the Lord is? Do we understand what God's will is? God wants us, once we are born again, once we are saved, He wants us to be witnesses unto Him. He wants us to grow in the grace of God. He wants us to grow in the knowledge of Him. He wants us to reflect Him. This is the will of God. He doesn't want us to camp at the cross. And Paul goes on to say, And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Interesting enough, this is Rodney Howard Brown's second favorite verse of Scripture. His first was Joel chapter 2. This was his second. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is excess. But he says, but be filled. Now you know the, the tense here in the Greek. This is the perfect present tense. He's correct. He's writing, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation or excess. But he's saying, but be continually being filled. It's a continual Filled. You're never filled and walk away, but you're continually being filled. Do you want to know how to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it's all, all listed here. Speaking to one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When you come together, it's to uplift the Lord, to worship the Lord as we've been doing tonight. It wasn't glorious just to sing and praise and give God the majesty and the glory. Not come together and moan and complain and bitch and gripe and complain about your government, which is just as bad as... No, you've got a long way to get just as bad as ours. You're worrying about Brexit and this and that and the... Christians come together and it's all moaning and groaning and griping and traffic and this and the next thing. And then we... Go from grumbling and complaining to, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> and we expect the Lord to be amongst us. Saints, when you fall to the Spirit of God, you just want to glorify God. You want to speak of Him. You want to worship the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things, all things when you're, you have a flat tire, when you run out of petrol, and you, the wall in your gone collapses. That's all things. Those are the all things. And God happens to be in the all things. All the things that happened in your life and will happen in your life, God has permitted. That's because all things, if the saints will allow the all things to accomplish what the all things are meant to accomplish, then all things work out for the good. But when the saints mumble and groan and gripe and complain, because the all things is not what they want. In all things give thanks to God, because God is wanting to prune your character. He's wanting to change you. He's wanting to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. He's wanting to do that to me too. And so all things are needed. The good, the bad, and dare I say the ugly. <laughs> Giving thanks, verse 20, always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 21. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Paul actually doesn't stop there. What Paul has done by the Holy Spirit He's given an instruction to the church to be filled or to seek to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. He's now explaining how. By having a heart of worship. By glorifying the Lord together. By being thankful in every circumstance. Christians need to start looking as though they were baptized in water and not lemon juice. Most Christians wear a, a scowl on their face. Very scary Christians are. <laughs> you don't see much joy. Unless, of course, it's a name tag. And she happens to walk in the room. <laughs> no sense. We need to be thankful. We need to be joyous. Because in the worshipping of God, we are continually filled. Do you live a life of worship? 
Or do you wait for occasions like this? Are you a worshiper? In all things giving thanks? Glorifying God? Do you live a life of worship? Saints, we need to adopt a lifestyle of praise and, and worship. God is seeking those that will worship Him in spirit and truth. He's not looking for song singers. Now, it's wonderful to sing songs together. But what is the song of your heart? What is the song of your spirit? Can you spontaneously just break out into worship? Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. And then what Paul does now is he breaks us up. In the church, we submit one to another. None of us are exempt from submission. Whether you're an apostle, whether you walk on water, whether you're just serving quietly in the church, each one of us are under mutual submission. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. In the church of Jesus Christ, there is only one Lord. There is only one Master. The rest of us are fellow servants. The rest of us bow the knee to each other. Not in worship, but in surrender. Lifting the other, esteeming the other greater than themselves. God has gifted me in an area. But when I look at the body of Christ, I see that my gifting forms such a small fraction of the whole that I thank God that the whole church is not like me. And I pray that fellow fivefold ministers would come to that realization and revelation that yes, we have a gifting, but there are countless thousands more of gifts that we need. So I need you. I'm desperate for your gift. I am desperate for your gift. It's the truth. We've implemented this truth in our church back home. It's some, it's, these are things that are true to me. They, 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 they are cemented in my heart. And what we, what's happened in our church is absolutely phenomenal. The church has taken on a life of its own. They organize meetings amongst themselves. They, we have a church prayer meeting on a Tuesday night. There are folk that, that live far away and they say, well, really it's difficult to get to the church. So we're going to start two prayer meetings. Different parts of the city. So now we've got three prayer, three prayer meetings on a Tuesday. I heard recently that... Um, a whole group of people meet on a Friday. Just get together to worship God, to pray, to study the Word. They need to ask permission. Because I know the brethren. We submit one to another in the fear of God. There's only one Lord in our church. In our church, my name is David. Anybody calling me pastor gets rebuked. Paul then takes this mutual submission into the family. Wives, submit to husbands. Husbands, love your wife. There's a submission. The wife submits herself to the headship of the husband. The husband submits his heart to his wife and exalts her. Then Paul brings in the family. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, don't grieve your... He uses the word, he says, uh, don't provoke your children. Mutual submission. He then goes out the family, and he goes to the workplace. Masters, or, or servants, labor is unto the Lord. Masters, stop threatening your servants. Do you want to be full of the Holy Spirit? Learn submission. Learn to bend the knee. Being self-willed, saints, grieves the Spirit. Not submitting to one another grieves the Holy Spirit. 
Living in sin grieves the Holy Spirit. Being unthankful, unholy, unloving grieves the Holy Spirit. Not walking in faith quenches the Holy Spirit. It is God's delight to give us the Spirit. This is His promise, saints. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those who are far off. But you have to ask the Father. You have to ask the Father to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got to understand and have a revelation of your deep need for Him. Please, I pray that what I've shared tonight will so grip your heart that you would see through the Word of God, not the Word of David, but through God's Word, that without the Holy Spirit, we are ill-equipped. We are disqualified for extending the kingdom. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ were forbidden to minister until they were full of the Holy Spirit, how much more do you and I, who do not have that authority, who do, do, do not have or do not have that in, do not have that instruction that they receive, how much more do you and I need to be full of the Holy Spirit? But it's something that we need to ask God for. We need to first make sure our heart is right. Let us stop the strife and the contentions. Let us stir up our faith and stop this fear, this insane this paranoia about Satan coming into the church. He comes in where he's welcomed in, saints. And he's petrified to go where the people who know their God are. Because those who know their God will do great exploits because of the power of God. Can we close in prayer? Blessed Father, my God, Lord, I, I pray for each one of us. Abba, Lord, if anybody perceived that or thought that I was angry, oh God, please, let that not be what is heard and understood. But Lord, that your cry, your desperate cry to your church to come back to you, to yield to you, just to do what you have asked, that you might fill us with your spirit, so that we might stand. Oh God, you who know what lies ahead. Lord, you who know what is in store for each of us individually. Father, are pleading and crying with us to be yielded, to be humble, to trust you. Father, I pray for all who would say, Oh God, forgive my unbelief. Forgive me for dying you. Forgive me for grieving your spirit through my attitude. Lord, as many as would repent and say, please, Abba, fill me with your spirit. Lord, I bless you and I thank you, my God, that you are no respecter of persons. You show no partiality. You have no favorites, Abba. You love us equally. You love us all. What you'll do for one, you'll do for us all. Lord, I pray that you baptize, that you fill us anew. For those of us, my Lord, who have waxed cold and that you would fill us again in Jesus' name. Thank you, Abba, that if we who are wicked would give good things to our children, we bless you and we thank you that you the much more would give the Holy Spirit to them or ask. So, Abba, we ask, please, Father, we cannot stand in our own strength and we beseech thee, fill us with your Spirit again in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Saints, the Lord bless you. Truly may He bless you. He loves you deeply. You are valuable. Stop seeing yourselves just as pew warmers. You are priests and you are kings in the house of God. Draw close to Him. Let Him fill you with His Spirit. That you may run the race that He has set before you. And one day you will hear the words, Well done, thy good and thy faithful servant.